Hey everyone, welcome back to Trek on the Tube. This is my review and Easter eggs video for episode 2 of season 1 of Star Trek Discovery, Battle at the Binary Stars. As usual, I have something that I want to talk about before we get started, and that thing is that the episode names don't appear on screen. This doesn't affect the quality of the show in any way, of course, but I thought it was worth mentioning because it is the first Star Trek series to break the mold. I've always personally loved seeing the episode names on screen, but I gotta admit, I didn't even notice they were missing until I watched the episodes a second time around. Okay, so, moving on. Episode 2. Was it good? Well, yeah. I mean, I did find it weaker than the pilot, but I still did enjoy it. The general feel of the episode was a lot less Trek, and maybe that's what put me off a little. Considering both episodes together create a sort of self-contained prologue to the series, it was to be expected that the second episode would feature more action sequences and less exposition. And so naturally, it felt closer to what we're used to seeing in the Kelvin Timeline movies rather than any of the other TV series. I must say watching both episodes back to back greatly contributes to taking away that Trek feel. With everything happening in episode 2, you kind of forget those slower moments from episode 1. Rewatching them a few days apart really helped separate them in my mind, and I suppose give them each their own identity. All that being said, the seven years earlier scene in the beginning felt just as classic Star Trek as anything in the pilot. We get a greeting in a transporter room followed by a slow and steady walk down a corridor to a turbo lift. All of this with very simple camera work and even some pretty strong techno babble. The episode cuts back to present day and Captain Georgiou tries to talk some peace into the Klingons before they refuse and the battle begins. To be honest, she was very diplomatic and the episode really makes a point of showing that the Federation was not responsible for the situation. The reason why I felt this episode was weaker is because somehow I got the sense concessions were made simply to move the plot in the direction the writers wanted it to move. At some point, the Shenzhou has no shields, no weapons, no warp, and what? No chief engineer? I mean, there's not one person handy enough on the entire ship to even fix one of the broken systems? Don't get me wrong, this isn't necessarily an error or even a problem. It just feels like the writers didn't think too much about it and rather preferred to focus on Saru's plan to blow up the neck of the Klingon ship. Again. It seems a little convenient that the tractor beams lead to the neck of the Klingon ship. Tractor beams would seem more useful near the cargo bay, a very less vital section. Also, even when the shields are at maximum and holding, the Shenzhou gets ripped apart nonetheless, which conveniently helps Burnham leave the brig. To be fair, I complain about these kind of details in every movie and every TV show I watch, so I'm not specifically bashing on Discovery. We all simply want the things we love to be the best they possibly can. Which brings us to the worst of episode 2, or should I say the only thing that was actually bad? The trial. Why did it take place in a dark room, with no one around? Burnham couldn't even see the faces of the people she was talking to. It didn't feel like a Starfleet or Federation court-martial, it felt like a Cardassian interrogation. Unless they explain this retroactively as being a somewhat unofficial hearing, it will forever remain a bit of a dodgy scene. But I guess that's okay, because that's all it really was. Just one scene. The rest was fine. I mean, the acting was great, the CGI was great, the sets were great, the props were great, the music was great. The episode was good. And as a season premiere, both episodes work very well. This is probably one of the strongest beginnings I've seen on a TV show in a while, to be honest. I'm very proud to see Star Trek moving to the top of the TV game once again. I'm so happy about all this. Remain Klingon, God damn it. Okay, so it's time to move on to the Easter eggs, references, and just... Things that I want to point out. Just like in the previous video, I'm going to start with the Klingons because there's a lot to say, starting with Vok. Mr. Albino here says that Takuvma has devised a way to hide his ship behind a cloak of invisibility. So that explains the inconsistency we previously talked about. Takuvma created his own cloaking device. And considering up until now he hasn't been on the best of terms with the house leaders, it's only fair to assume the Empire doesn't have access to the technology. If the cloak remains specific to Takuvma's ship, and is destroyed sometime before the end of the season, yes, canon would be slightly changed, but it still very much works out. The Kufman name drops the four founding members of the Federation in his hate speech, and also refers to Donatu 5, a planet first mentioned in the original series. It would seem one of the few battles between the Federation and the Klingon Empire that happened during the Cold War took place at that planet in 2245. We also get references to the Klingon High Council and Stovakor, which is Klingon Heaven. Going back to the blood conundrum, things are just getting worse for Star Trek at this point, because in this episode we get to see both lavender and red blood. For an observation, Takuvma strikes down at Georgiou and this happens. 
The blade seems to be bent, and I'm pretty convinced it's not supposed to be that way. Moving along to the Vulcan side of things, Sarek performs a mind meld on Burnham, but not just that. He also apparently transferred into her mind a part of his Katra, which is essentially the Vulcan soul or spirit. The first time we hear about this is in Star Trek 2 and Star Trek 3, but Enterprise also expanded a bit on it in its fourth season. To make this simple, at least some Vulcans have the capacity to transfer the essence of themselves into someone else's mind before they die. Discovery went a bit further and made Sarek do this to Burnham when he was still reasonably young. This also gave him the ability to mind meld with her from light years away. Random details? Just like in the Kelvin timeline, we get some original series bridge sounds when we're on the bridge of the Shenzhou. The computer actually says working at some point, which is also an original series nod. Most of the Federation ships have names that either reference something from previous Trek or someone awesome in real life. We get an on-screen communication when Takuma broadcasts on many frequencies, and to be honest, I really prefer that. However, I must admit, losing the Admiral's signal while he was holographically visible added some nice tension to the scene. One last thing I want to point out, having ethical protocols in the brig is extremely dangerous. I'm not saying it's a bad idea for the show, and the fact we've never seen it before doesn't mean it contradicts canon. I'm just saying, do you really want ethical protocols in your brig? Khan, Data, even Spock would be able to break out within minutes using logic and general intelligence. It's just a truly scary concept, really. Anyway, that's it for me. Please let me know if I missed something. Please tell me what you thought of the episode. Thank you very much for watching. Like, subscribe, and uh, as usual, live long and prosper.